Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I would like to remind you that these seminars are organized by Georgian Students for Liberty. Uh, now, today, I want to introduce you our very special guest, Iruni Arinio, Students for Liberty's European Events Associate and Deputy Director of Juan de Marianas Institute, and Fabio Fernandez, who is a media and communications person uh, for the Consumer Choice Center, and uh, now he is Students for Liberty, Liberty's Con Consumer Choice Center. Uh, they will discuss the uh, current situations in Italy and Spain caused by COVID-19. Uh, yeah, Iruna and Fabio, uh, each of you will be given the time of 20 minutes and then will be Q&A section where the attendees have an opportunity to ask you some questions. Uh, then panelists will be able to read this. Uh, so please write the question uh, in Q&A. Uh, once again, thank you for your participation. Iruna, uh, we all know that the situation in your country is really serious. So let's, let's talk about your experiences and share your circumstances to our attendees. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for, for inviting me. I'm gonna share my screen. Give me just one second, because I have prepared a small presentation to explain you what is happening here in, in Spain. Well, uh, I guess you, you, can, you can hear me well. Uh, first of all, what, what I have prepared is a small timeline, timeline to, to explain how, how everything started in Spain. Uh, I'm going to try to, to sum up everything. Um, well, first of all, or the, the, the main important thing to, to highlight here is the, the first case we had in Spain was confirmed in one of our islands in La Gomera, is in, in the Canary Island, um, and was the 31, the 31st of uh, January. At that time, uh, the director of, of the Center of, uh, for Coordination of Health Alerts and Emergencies said that there will be no more than a few diagnosed uh, cases in Spain, that we uh, will have the situation that China was having and that uh, Italy was starting to, to have. And then uh, nine days uh, later, we had the, the second infected in a totally different and um, far Iceland was in Palma, uh, part of, of uh, Balear Islands. And then everything started. Uh, Mobile World Congress uh, announces its cancellation, even though the Spanish government said that the decision wasn't related to, to the situation uh, with the uh, COVID-19. Then uh, first we had the first cases in the Spanish peninsula. Uh, and then uh, infections started to, to increase. Uh, our first uh, death was uh, confirmed on the 3rd of March, even though the death was dated from the 13th of February. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't clear if it was caused by COVID or a normal, um, a normal flu and why we didn't know about the death until the, the 3rd of, of March. At that time, with the first death, and we had, we had 169 cases confirmed, uh, the, our government uh, didn't announce any, any measure and start and continue saying that, that the situation in Spain uh, was under control and, and we wouldn't have the same situation as in China or, or in Italy. But um, one of the key moments of all this uh, period was the 8th of, of March. Um, as, you, as you all know, 8th of March is the uh, International Women's Day. So we had a big, a huge demonstration, not only in, Spain, uh, in Madrid, but in also uh, important cities in, in Spain. Uh, basically, what happened is that at that moment we had uh, 674 um, infected people and, and 17 deaths uh, and our government didn't cancel any of these huge events, not only the demonstrations, but also uh, we had, we had um, huge exhibitions taking place in, in Madrid with thousands of, of attendees and some other uh, sport and, and and leisure events organizing in, 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 all the con in, in the whole country. 
And after this day, uh, suddenly the, the cases uh, started to, to uh, increase rapidly. We, we had, six, as I said, more than 600 on the 8th. And then on, on the 9th, 9th of, of March, um, we, we got up with more than 1,000 cases and, and 20, 28 deaths. And this day, uh, the Spanish uh, Minister of, of, of Health, to, together with Madrid Region and, and some of the municipal, uh, municipalities um, were, were more um, affected by the virus, decided to close and suspend all the educational activities uh, from kindergartens to universities in Madrid, all the region, but also in Victoria and, and La Bastida, that are two cities in the Basque Country, in the no north of Spain. And they also uh, recommended the elderly and vulnerable people to stay at home, even though it wasn't mandatory at the time. Then, um, at the end of, of the week, our Prime Minister, Pedro Sánchez, uh, now announces the declaration of the state of alarm, but it was a uh, decree the day after he announces. So all the people um, started to, for example, go to, to secondary residences, to uh, other parts that had uh, less infections than, for example, in Madrid. Um, flights weren't suspended. Uh, people could um, travel, not only uh, internationally, but also within the country. And finally, on the, on the 14th, uh, they decided to, to declare the, the state of alarm at, at nine o'clock. It, it seems that, that uh, the government has the Council of, of Ministers, who uh, was the, the um, official institution that, that could declare this state of alarm. It seems that, that they had um, some argues because uh, right now, so you know the situation in Spain, we have uh, a coalition government between um, a social democrat party and a uh, left wing slash a communist party. They are both governing Spain. So it seems that, that they had uh, some argues uh, regarding the measures to put in place with, uh, together with the state of alarm. So uh, the, the, the declaration of the state of alarm, I think it was planned to, to happen at around 3 p.m. But finally, they, they declared that at 9 uh, in, the, in the night. And with the state of alarm, everything happened. Uh, I'm going to explain shortly um, the measures included in, in the state of alarm in Spain. Uh, basically, what, what happened with the, this declaration is that uh, they um, unified um, the command of all the authorities, both uh, from the public administrations, city councils, um, workers for, for, from um, state ministers and, and these kind of, of institutions. And also law enforcement bodies, uh, our police and army, were commanded by, um, by the central government. Then, of course, they declared a mandatory uh, quarantine for, for everyone. Uh, but, uh, well, together with the limitation of, of people's uh, freedom of movement, which is implicit in the, in the mandatory quarantine, with the exceptions, of course, uh, to go to, to work, to supermarket, pharmacy, banks, uh, to assist elderly or walk the door. Also, they, they uh, declare or they close all the stores, apart, apart from, of course, supermarkets and basically um, these uh, selling foodstuffs, uh, which, of course, included museums, libraries, theaters, and, and they also had to, clo uh, to close um, gardens and public parks because when the when the it, it happened something uh, quite funny and when the, the the state of alarm was declared um all the people started to to uh, run and walk on the public uh, gardens and parks so they had so, so they had to they had to to close it to close them to and finally, uh, restaurants, cafes, and bars were uh, only allowed to, to deliver food, so were close to the public, but they could work 
are preparing food uh, to um, deliver services. Well, now uh, this was the situation um, before the 14th of uh, March. And from then uh, on, we had uh, what I have identified as, as some problems related not only to the state of alarm, but also to what happened before the declaration of the state of alarm. The first problem I see is um, government ineptitude. What happened with the government? It's basically that they didn't want it uh, to assume that uh, we had a public uh, health problem until it was too late. As, as I mentioned, uh, when we declared the state of alarm, we had more uh, that, that 1,000 of uh, infect, infected people, and I think I, it was 20, 28 deaths. Then um, our both uh, fourth uh, vice prime minister, because we have fourth um, vice prime ministers, and also the minister of, of social agenda, uh, who is the same person, Pablo Iglesias, the communist guy, and our prime minister, Pedro Sanchez, skipped the quarantine. Uh, the first one did it uh, to attend uh, the Council of Ministers because um, her, his um, wife, was um, positive at COVID, and the same happened uh, after with Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. The, uh, his wife was also positive, and and he and he made um, he delivered a press conference, uh, skipping quarantine. Apart from that, um, we had some arguments between uh, different political parties because some of them wanted to to have the plenary sessions of our national congress telemat telematically uh, from home as, as we are having this uh, webinar together uh, today but it seems that um, there are um, legislation um, limitations to do this and it can be due to a strict in, in the interpretation of, of the legislation that they are not uh, allowing to, to do this. And, and right now, I think we only had three plenary sessions uh, since we started the, this um, mandatory quarantine. But of course, um, it's not a cool way to say to the population, you have to stay at home and you, you, don't, you don't have to work. But we still um, do these things um, offline and not only us the, the deputies but also the the people that, that that is already working there people who is cleaning uh recording sessions and 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 this kind of things more about the government ineptitude and it, it happened recently um they started to filter uh, press conferences uh, basically, what happened is that the director of communication at the Spanish government decided to filter and making himself the questions to the Spanish representative during uh, the press conferences. And basically, media uh, media outlets uh, didn't have the possibility to cross examine and to make themselves the, the questions uh, directly there, neither offline nor uh, telematically. Finally, uh, this was solved because six important media outlets decided not to participate anymore. Announces, uh, announced this, I think, three days ago, and then the government changed the, the system, and they are saying that they, are, uh, they will allow um, in the future to, to have a telematic participation of, of the media outlets so they can uh, make questions. Well, everything uh, apart from the government ineptitude, um, let's go to the second problem we had, and it was the lack of, of sanitary material, what we call individual protection equipments, basically masks, waterproof uh, guns, protection glasses, gloves, and respirators. What happened is that uh, two weeks before the declaration of the state of alarm, we ran out of, of everything because the panic uh, generated for the Italian situation, people started uh, to buy this uh, this material in high quantities, and also our government didn't decide to, to start purchasing uh, so they could have in the future. 
Um, what also happened is that together with the state of alarm, we, we, they, or the government centralized the purchase of sanitary material, uh, but this um, make more difficult and we lost some, some um, buying opportunities um, due to of, of this decision. So they finally decided to allow regions to start buying it. So we now have more material because uh, regions can regions, uh, so you, you have an idea, is like uh, is like landers in, in 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 Germany or states in in, in United States. So they are they have autonomy. Uh, they are quite in, independent in, in 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 a way. They can make some decisions. But of course, the problem with the state of alarm is that everything is controlled by by the central government. But as I said, finally they decided to allow the, the, the regions to, to start buying it, so we could start to solve this, this problem. Basically, here you will, uh, you will find a couple of, of um, media news about this. Um, as, as you may, as you may, may see these uh, last days on, on the Spanish media, but also international, internationally, uh, Turkey it seems that that uh, they are uh, keeping uh, some materials that were purchased by our government, and we are not sure how this is going to end. But we had similar problems with with other equ equipment that we were that we were um, buying. The third problem is a lack of of health professionals. Here I. I I'm going to explain uh, some um, data. Basically, we had a, and we have, we already have a big problem uh, with beds, hospital beds, because um, we have only three beds per meal uh, per 1,000 sorry people in Spain, which is less than the average in in Europe. That uh, this taking into consideration the, the high number of infected people and, and people who is uh, already at the hospital um, make the situation more difficult than, than it is. Um, even though uh, we have a, 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 a quite a high radio of doctors per thousand of people, um, the main problem is that um, approximately um, around 15% of the infected people are health professionals. So this is less people that can help us uh, to recover from, from the virus. And, and also the, the third problem we had um, in regards to, to health professionals, well, this is more related to material than to health professionals, but is that the radio of um, I Cooper um, 100,000 people is 9.7. Uh, so we are the the fifth country with less. This uh, IQ is is a, a special bed with respirators that we need for for um, people that 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 cannot um, breathe for for themselves. And we are one of the countries in, in the European uh, Union with less than, than these beds. So we, of course, this also um, is, a, is, a, is a big problem for us to, to recover from the virus. The fourth problem um, we see is the lack of, of tests. Even though we, we don't have clear information about the number of, of tests, tests we are doing in Spain, the last number I could find was published on the 10th of March, so before the, the, um, they declared the state of alarm. I, maybe um, the number is somewhere, but I couldn't find it. And we are only using PCR tests. Uh, I'm not an expert in how to differentiate this, but basically it seems that this test requires a specialized staff and they are not, of course, um, quick tests. And apart from that, uh, when the government decided to start 
uh, buying rapid tests. They bought uh, six, six, um, 640 thousand defective kits from Chinese company. Uh, this company wasn't certified by the Chinese government. Uh, the Chinese embassy in Spain also um, tweet, uh, tweeted about, about this. The, the Chinese government also informed them, our government, that this company wasn't certified. So yeah, we, we bought defective kits and this also make the situation worse than it than than it than it is finally um i have identified a fifth problem and is that we follow the chinese and the italian way and we didn't follow the the model that i think we should follow that is taiwan or south korean um, way basically the differences between these models is we in in, in china well in China, a, a slightly difference, but in, in Italy and Spain, we um, quarantine the, the whole population as a mand mandatory measure. And in Taiwan and South Korea, for example, they only um, make mandatory uh, the, the quarantine of the infected people or cities that had more like a, huge amount of, of infected people. And they did this, they, they implement this measure in a, in a premature uh, way. So when they had the, the first cases and we did it um, later. Then apart from that, um, citizens had uh, protective measures, both in, in Taiwan and South, South Korea, when they still, they, they began to, to, to have the first uh, infections. Uh, we don't have it. Uh, we, uh, for example, if, as, as I was explaining, our, our healthcare um, professionals don't have material and the rest of, of population neither. Uh, even though we, we, we have a lot of donations from companies and individuals. Uh, and two more differences was the, we suspended uh, flights from from infected areas uh, from China very late, and and Taiwan and South Korea did it um, when everything started. And finally, as I as I mentioned, the the problem with tests, we are not doing a massive tests to our population, so we don't have uh, clear numbers of, for example, um, infected people that is not not showing symptoms which is also uh, a problem in terms of see how we can uh, better manage the quarantines. If, if we can, for example, quarantine only some cities or only some, uh, for example, citizens that are infected. Uh, and I think this, this is one of the, the most helpful things in order to, to fight the, the, the virus. But aside from the problems, I wanted to briefly mention the case of uh, the, the region of Madrid. I think is one of the, of the most successful cases in, in Spain, even though it's the region with more uh, coronavirus uh, cases and deaths, it was the first region that decided to take uh, preventive measures. As I, as I mentioned on the uh, 9th of uh, March, they decided to close all the and suspend all the educational activities, and which is amazing, they increased the number of of these specialized beds from six uh, more than six hundred to um, more than one thousand, which is a lot. They created a, a huge hospital in Ifema. Ifema is a a big conference conference building outside of Madrid, and then they also uh, increase the, the, the normal hospital beds from, from more than 20,000 to more than, than 24,000, not only with IFEMA, but also we started to medicalize hotels. Some hotels had uh, offered beds to, to treat um, COVID infections. And basically, here are some, some uh, news about, about this, some, here you can you can see some um, 
hotels that that offer the the hotel as a as a hospital and uh, the minister of finances of the madrid region government explaining to the cnn the how how they are uh, working with ifema um new hospital and the different measures that, that, they, that they are implementing well and now uh i'm gonna finish i promise i'm i'm, I'm trying to to not to take much of your time so i think i'm gonna um the only five minutes speaking about this but i i, I want to summarize the current situation because i think it's it's important to see how we are right now basically on the 25th of march we were supposed to to finish the uh, well to to um end with the state of alarm but uh the, our congress voted the the extension and most likely uh, we, we, we will be extended by April 2026. 20, we had to, to end it, the, the first extension uh, at the end of this week, but uh, most likely we will be extended to April 26. Also on the 29th of March, our government decided to implement a total lockdown. Um, now we had uh, people was allowed to to work, to go to work so some companies were open now no they are not opening uh we we only have open supermarkets pharmacies and and tobacco stores so the rest of people cannot cannot work unless they they work uh, remotely and now it seems that um cases and deaths are progressively decreasing which is a uh, great news and of uh finally which i think it's also uh, a very good news is that some personalities close to to our government uh, ex um ex prime uh, ex uh, ministers of socialist governments that 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 we had before and and these kind of people started to criticize the extension of the quarantine uh, quarantine measures they created a, a manifesto so it seems that um a sense of uncomfortability with the situation is starting to raise in spain which i think is important even though uh we know that that some measures are necessary we have to be very careful and we have to to check what our government is doing so they are not overpassing um what is expected uh from them and basically the the numbers today well uh, yesterday night are that ones in spain it i know that that for the countries where where you have uh, where you are from and and you have less cases this is a lot but i want to show you the the um, the line that shows um how this is is how this is going and as i said it seems that everything is is starting to decrease which is uh, great to to see if if uh, we can finally end with with uh, this nightmare and last but not least um i want to briefly explain how i see the future well not how I see because it's very difficult, but how I think the future will, will look like. And here I have identified some threats and, and some opportunities. Starting with threats, um, I'm a little bit worried about a potential nationalist and anti-globalization uh, movements to raise as a reaction uh, of, of, the, of this pandemic. I also um, I'm also worried about if some of the restrictive measures that uh, we have implemented in different countries will persist after the health emergency, as happened with um, 11th of, of September, in order to have more security and less liberty. And finally, of course, um, an important part, and is that uh, this situation will, of course, damage our economies high unemployment rates and indebtedness uh, of some companies but 
to end with, a, with an optimistic message, I also wanted to include some opportunities that I see uh, from this pandemic. The first one is that I think we will have strongest communities with high levels of private solidarity. We are, uh, we are seeing this in, we have proofs of, of this in not only in Spain, but also in, in, in other countries. A lot of companies that are uh, making huge donations, a lot of individuals that, that are helping elderly, elderly, and a lot of initiatives. For example, uh, both SFL Italy and, and SFL um, Spain are running crowdfunding co campaigns uh, to help the cred rows. So I think this is great. And the second opportunity I see, I think we will uh, have a window of opportunity for some libertarian reforms. We will, in, in, when we have crisis like, like the one we are going to face um, in the next uh, month, I think is a good opportunity so we can uh, start um, explaining how we think uh, things can, can be solved. And I think we should do it. And well, uh, basically, this is what I wanted to explain to you. I, 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 I hope it, it was interesting. And of course, thank you. Thank you so much for, for listening to me. Juna, thank you for your hard work. Fabio, today Italy is the most popular country after the China. Let's share your experiences uh, to our attendees and explain today's situation. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. So um, talking from lockdown Italy and uh, Milan, especially, and uh, we've been locked since March 7, which means that now we are, uh, it's our anniversary today. So one month in lockdown. And um, John Hopkins University yesterday released, uh, actually they released on the 25th, uh, a possible estimate if we go on a short lockdown or if we go on a log long lockdown. And if we go on a short lockdown, the expectation is that we will be released from home or especially or uh, partially, I don't think everyone's going to be released at the same time, on the second week of June. And uh, if the government chooses to go with a long lockdown, probably on the first or the second week of July. That means that uh, Italy will be closed probably from three and a half and four months, uh, which is a long, long period, especially if you think uh, economically. Um, and of course, governments now have to change the name and they can call it, uh, they can't call it quarantine anymore because uh, three months of lockdown, it's, we have to find another term to define what's going on all around the world. And um, I think uh, I really explained very well what's happening uh, all around the world, and Italy isn't different. Uh, I think there are two main uh, problems uh, when it comes to Italy. So it's the inpatient beds, which, which is the ICU beds, so the uh, intense care units on the hospitals. So those are the special care units inside the hospital that can take care of more serious cases. And uh, Italy has an average European number of ICU beds. I think probably the same or a little bit more than Spain. But um, uh, that's a huge problem when you have a lot of people infected at the same time. Italy has a particularity that uh, it's very uh, significant for Italy, which is uh, the number of elderly people. So uh, Italy has the second oldest population in the world. And uh, the most vulnerable groups, as we will see, are the uh, older and the elderly. So... Um, those people need uh, the kind of beds that the ICU provides and the limited number of ICU beds limited the number of treatments that they can, they can provide to those people. Also, the second problem is the number of respirators, also usually associated with the ICU beds, but those are fundamental when people develop uh, uh, a more serious degree of the, the illness. And, um, also, in the number of respirators, Italy is on average on uh, on the European Union. So the best one would be, for example, Germany. Um, and, and this is a problem when you have a lot of people sick at the same time. So you probably heard a lot of uh, flattening the curve, which means that we don't 
we have to restrict the number of people going around and getting the disease at the same time in order to cope with the number of beds and ICU beds and respirators that the country has available. At the same time, the country kind of tried to uh, increase those numbers and try to uh, help the people that are more in need for, the, for those uh, intensive care units. And um, as you probably heard or watched it on, on television, um, the objective of the lockdown is, of course, to flatten the curve. And the Lombardia region, which is the one that Milan is located, is the worst in case of uh, number of cases, especially the city of Bergamo, which is very close uh, here, where the number of deaths is uh, really high. And um, the numbers uh, until yesterday in Italy are 130,000 cases, so a little bit more than Spain. Uh, so we are the third uh, most uh, infected country in the world, so the third globally. And we have 15,000 deaths, which puts us in the first place in number of deaths. And of course, the deaths are very much related with the number of elderly people, as I'm, I'm going to show you now. So uh, taking the example of Italy, we have 1% of people uh, of the deaths under peop uh, for people under the age of 50. Uh, between the age of 50 and 59 is 2.3 percent. Uh, between 60 and 69 years old, we have an 8.5 percent uh, death rate, so mortality rate. And uh, over 70, we have a mortality rate between 25 and 30 percent, which is uh, very, very high. So, uh, which is almost to say that one in every four people. Uh, older than 70 years old will probably die from this disease. And um, so I think the, the negative thing is to look at these numbers and see uh, how big they are and how uh, deathly this, this disease is and how it has been affecting, affecting Italy especially. But um, it also shows us that the disease is very focused in a risk group. So for me, the irony is that uh, we now are having to give up uh, most of our freedom and our liberties to save the life of those who fought for liberty and freedom in the past. So our grandparents uh, that fought for us and uh, fought war, civil liberties, uh, fought tyranny, uh, military governments. And this, um, I think this is the irony of being home and locked down in these uh, circumstances is that we are trying to uh, create a scenario where we are locking down everyone, taking their liberties, uh, but to protect those who fought for, uh, to, for us to have the liberties we have today. And I'm, in another note, um, I, I'm not going to continue for a long time talking about that. But uh, working for the Consumer Choice Center, we have a separate project that we call 21 Democracy. And we try with the 21 Democracy to uh, identify and fight governments that, that uh, are authoritarian and uh, thus they, they uh, limit uh, consumers and li limit people's freedom and liberties. And uh, we launched two days ago a project that's called Fight Corona, Not Liberties. And we are trying to demonstrate that uh, governments need to focus on fighting coronavirus with innovation, with uh, policy making that it's, it is smart, uh, rather than taking liberties and freedom from people. So locking down everyone uh, proved to be in the beginning of the, the this pandemic to be something that could help us flatten the curve, but keeping everyone locked down for a long period of time is uh, not possible, uh, especially economically. So if you take the United States, for example, they have 3.5 million people unemployed so far. And uh, we are proposing a different approach to this situation. And our approach and our public policy recommendations are based in four pillars. So the first one is to protect. So we need to protect the vulnerable groups and encourage them to stay home, which is the elderly people or people with, uh, with disease that put them in a more vulnerable position. Um, we need to allow them and allow people that are no, non-vulnerable uh, from these non-vulnerable groups to continue their economic and social activities, creating value in society, 
creating value economically uh, to help us fight this pandemic and also protect those that cannot fight with us and need to be uh, locked down at home because they are vulnerable. Uh, we have a third pillar, which is innovate, and we need policymakers to help us reduce red tape and regulations that might delay testing of patients. And uh, we've seen a lot of examples all around the world. For example, I mean, I'm originally from Brazil, and in Brazil, they are now allowing uh, people to have uh, virtual uh, consultation with doctors and prescriptions uh, online. So e-prescription is something that could never be imagined in Brazil because we have a great lob from uh, med med physicians and med medical staff. And now uh, this situation created an opportunity to the evolution of e-prescriptions in Brazil. So we need to find those more uh, innovative solutions that can help us cope with the, the spread of the pandemic instead of limiting our liberties. And um, the last one, the fourth one is to avoid. So the lockdown uh, uh, population for long periods of time, so months, uh, weeks, uh, it's not only feasible, but it's not desirable by anyone. And uh, we risk by doing so to create mass unemployment, poverty, social problems, and uh, we have seen many of those problems in south of Italy. So now going back a little bit to Italy, Italy since the lockdown, things have come uh, even have worsened ever since. So I saw a few days ago or a couple of weeks ago, uh, people saying that we are now experiencing what socialism would be. And I can say that in Italy is more or less like that. So if you go to the supermarket, you have to stay between 30 and minutes and one hour in line before you get in. When you get in, especially here in the Lombardy, you don't have products. Uh, I go, I don't have flour. I go another day and I don't have eggs. Uh, those kind of things is something that uh, you see, for example, in socialist countries in the past. And it's something that we've seen uh, now again. And, and most of it is because the government locked everyone down. Everyone is going to the supermarket at the same time. That's why we have huge lines. And they stopped all uh, non-essential factories, non-essential production, which means that products are not being produced and they are not available all the time. So you may get one brand one day and another brand another day, or you may not have it at all when you go to the supermarket. And in the South, uh, that where people are more vulnerable in the sense that in South or Southern Italy, you have uh, a more poor uh, population and they don't have uh, formal work. So most of the time they have informal kind of work. They haven't been working for the past month and a lot of people are unemployed. We have seen people sacking supermarkets, so going taking everything, not paying. So now they have a police state down there where they are po uh, placing all the supermarkets in order to keep the order. And uh, it's a very sad situation. Um, and as I said, it's not feasible in the long run. So governments need to start thinking what is the best solution. Uh, Irene mentioned the case of South Korea, uh, Taiwan. Uh, those are great examples of how to uh, flatten the curve at the same time, keeping the, the economic activity and keeping uh, the sense of normality that it's, uh, it's been taken away from us here in Italy. And uh, every week we have a new decree that reduces our freedom. Uh, the last one uh, was released, it's always Saturday night. So the last one last Saturday night, saying that now we have to wear masks everywhere we go when we leave home. But the problem is masks are not available in supermarkets. They are not available in pharmacies because since the past month, everybody bought them and uh, they are not available. And the government doesn't provide it. And if you go out without wearing that, you get a fine of up to 4,000 euros. So it's insane uh, to think that we came to this situation uh, in a short period of time. So I don't really believe that Italy is doing its best and the model of Italy should be followed by everyone else. Um, but of course, our prime minister thinks uh, differently. He went yesterday on NBC uh, to give an interview in the United States saying uh, how the United States could use more of Italy's uh, model and Italy's uh, uh, solution to the problem. 
And I don't agree. I don't think it's working. We've been flattening the curve very slowly. Uh, it seems that we are still in the high peak. Um, and it's passed already a month. So uh, I don't see uh, in our future uh, a solution uh, that would work locking everyone down. So uh, I think now we can open to a little bit of questions. I'm sorry I don't have a presentation, but that's what I wanted to, uh, to tell you all about my experience here. Um, uh, Fabio, thank you very much for your interesting report presentation. Lecture, sorry. Uh, now we are able to read the questions in Q&A, uh, or I can read each one and then you can give us where it depends on what will be comfortable for you. What do you prefer? I think oh, if you want to read it, I think it's, it's, it's cool. Okay, I'll read. Uh, the first one is, uh, hi Irune, glad to uh, see you again. When we arrived in Madrid, almost no one ha was wearing face masks or gloves. I had feeling that people did not take uh, the issue seriously. I think this way because of the change uh, um, I saw among the people at time of leaving Spain. More and more people were taking the prote uh, protective measures against the virus spread. Do you think uh, there was a problem with people's attitude also? Could the people have been more careful? Well, thank you uh, for the question, Dachi. Um, it's complicated. I mean, um, first of all, because we are not used to use these kind of protective measures. For example, in, in uh, Asian countries, when people have a normal flu, uh, you can easily see uh, people wearing masks, for example, as a way to avoid um, infections. In Europe, this is not something that you can see normally. People are not used to do this. And also, apart from that, the information that we were receiving from our government at that time was to stay calm, that we um, had a problem at that time. So, of course, we cannot say um, it's only government's fault. Of course not. But when you see that your government is saying that, that everything is okay, uh, you see uh, multitudinary events happening. It's difficult to um, analyze the level of, of um, or the, the state of the situation and then decide to, to take preventive measures. So I think it's both a problem of, of these three things uh, that we are not used to, the, the attitude of our government and of course it, it was uh, a lack of, of responsibility uh, from, from, uh, from citizens, yeah, of course, but not only. And I also think that it's not, uh, everyone doesn't agree with that in the sense that uh, protective masks in the beginning was said to be kept to those who are sick, so uh, helping them not spread the virus to other people and now they are saying that the financial times published last okay. week a piece that they were saying that countries that uh impose masks to everyone are uh, more successful in flattening the curve which is south korea and taiwan and those kind of examples so i don't think the medical uh, community agrees with what is the best solution for for wearing masks and uh that's something we, we it's not uh, proved yeah, I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you too. Uh, I'm curious, is there ability in Spain or in Italy for private companies to import those quick tests so the government wouldn't be uh, the only and one policy importer? Well, in, in Spain, uh, basically, the, the main problem is that even though you can, um, and now I'm not sure if you can as a private company, but even though you can, you have to do it through the government, not through the government in a way that they have to actually buy it. But if you buy it, you have to give them to the to the government because, for example, all, all, all the last purchase, the, the one with, with defective uh, test kits was made by, by a company, uh, 
but was um, decided by the government. So I think uh, this doesn't change like the situation, to be honest. Sorry, Fabio. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that um, the, the question is very focused on importing those quick tests, but I think governments need to develop them. Uh, importing tests from China is a, a temporary solution if you don't have your own tests. Uh, but every country needs to develop them and uh, because this is going to help us in future policy making and who can be uh, released or not from their homes because we need to test who has the immunity to the virus. So uh, I don't think importing is the best solution. I think uh, countries should, so governments should uh, support innovation from the private sector to develop those kits. Uh, of course, they're going to be paid for that. Uh, and that's how you create competitive uh, situation that uh, labs and pharmaceutical companies are going to uh, try to deliver the best test that, that performs the best and not uh, defected imported from China. So. Thank you. The next question is what are your predictions and hopes for the nearest future? I think I did mine. So, Fabio, if you want to <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I think uh, I agree with you. I think that uh, in the short term, we are seeing our freedom and our liberty being reduced, and that's not good. And uh, a lot of countries are taking this opportunity to pass measures that are authoritarian. You can see the example of Hungary, that it's now a totalitarian stage. Uh, you can see the example of the United States when the Democrats are passing uh, many state solutions or uh, bills that are included in the coronavirus crisis. So I think uh, in the terms of policy making, it's not a good scenario to look forward. But I think it creates opportunities, as I mentioned in Brazil, of uh, in innovation being allowed and uh, bills being changed in order to help the private sector fight the, the, this crisis. So um, we have to be optimistic. We have to keep the good spirits. Um, but I don't see, if you're talking about Italy, uh, not not very good hopes in the future. Uh, the last one is uh, how big overall do you think mass tests have in the in the situation? Well, I think we had examples of of Taiwan, and South Korea, and as Fabio was explaining, mass uh, mass tests allows you to know uh, who is infected and is not showing symptoms and who has the immunity and is not going to be infected anymore, or at least uh, fight and, 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 and yeah, fight, successfully fight the, the virus. And this, of course, can allow and is allowing governments to uh, decide whether to extend um, quarantines, but not only to the, to the whole country, but uh, to a small part of the population. And I think it's at least more respectful with individual liberties. And also, as we can see um, right now, or as data is showing us, at least it's, it's more effective that, that we, what we are doing without having mass tests. Absolutely, I agree. I think um, mass tests is going to be uh, the big difference between countries that succeed in containing the virus and reducing the lockdown period uh, than countries that do not have mass tests and do not provide them effectively. So a uh, huge difference for countries that now can develop and have great, good, uh, affordable, reliable tests. Uh, and this is going to change policy making in the, the next months. Thank you. And also we have one question for Irune. Uh, a state of emergency is a great chance for the governments to seize more and more powers limitlessly. Therefore, I'm interested if the SFL officials are planning some actions ahead of the time in order to stop the government from grabbing uh, any more power after crossing certain logical points. 
Well, um, right now, uh, I don't really see uh, actions that are actually um, helping to, to end this situation. But I think um, the political parties that are uh, right that are not in the government right now, they and only them have the the power to um, to end the, the multiple uh, extensions of of this state of of alarm um, from now on and after um, and two weeks ago when we had the first extension. Uh, this decision um, relies on on the on the Congress, National Congress. So now, not only the the executive power, but also the legislative can decide on this. Uh, hopefully, I think more parties are starting to realize that that this is not a cool way to 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 perform to to actually. Um, limit all all, all our uh, individual liberties to, to the whole population, but also I, I see a huge problem here, and is that this situation is quite comfortable for the government because uh, population has to stay at home and cannot uh, cannot go out and cannot demonstrate and 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 actually do something against the the government. So if we have to trust the only trust in our um, political parties, we have we have a huge uh, problem here. But of course, uh, we don't have um, right. I or at least I don't see uh, which tools can can we use to to get rid of of this situation. Thank you. And also we have one more question. <laughs> Can you tell me what happened with the faulty test from China that we are delivered to Spain? Um, it, it was a lack of transparency with the situation, so I can only explain what, what I have um, read in, in, in the newspaper. But basically, what, what happened is that um, China sent us or shared with us a list of uh, certified companies that were um, selling these tests. But the government, we don't know exactly the reason why, but the government decided to use um, a company from, from Spain as the intermediator between the company from China. So they use one of the, of the suppliers that this company uh, has for, for their own business. Um, and they bought these, uh, these kits directly from, from this Spanish company to. Uh, the third company in China that was not included in the in the list of, of certified companies uh, provided by by China when when we received the first batch of of these kits they realized that that were um, the feet the problem was that they didn't communicate this with with transparency they started to say that first of the first part of oh, the first version was that uh, they only had nine uh, nine thousand defective uh, kids. Then it was, I think, around um, fifty uh, eight thousand, and then finally we realized that is uh, six hundred forty thousand, which is <laughs> a different number and 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 quite um, quite high right now. Uh, and it seems that the company. Um, decided or at least said that uh, they are going to replace it for for um, for good ones but let's see what happens uh, I'm sorry I cannot provide you with more information but we don't really have uh, too many information about about all of this thank you I guess we are out of the questions uh, all right uh, can I just say one more thing uh, I sent on the group uh, the link for the change.org petition that we launched. So if you want to go ahead and sign the petition, uh, it's to help fight Corona, not liberties. Uh, we are almost with 100 uh, signatures. So if you're interested in supporting that project, please take a look. Great. Thank you. Uh, now, I'm sure that we are out of the questions. Uh, Irene and Fabio, thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Your input has been very helpful. 
I hope that this time of hardship will pass soon in your countries and in ours as well. Uh, so this was our last session of COVID-19. Uh, please be noted uh, that if you wish to become the member of our team, uh, check and fill out the link we put in our events. Uh, thank you once again and hope, you, uh, hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much and stay safe.